you for joining us on this live webinar today, March 28th, uh, 2023, uh, Ride the Wave of Economic Uncertainty at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for being this evening. Um, as stated, you know, we're going to go over this uh, disclaimer really quick. Boost Capital Group does not provide tax or legal advice. The material herein is provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice for an offer or solicitation to buy and sell <clears throat> securities. So hello everyone, this is uh, Philippe Sheligan speaking and uh, with uh, my partner Jeff, we co-founded uh, Boost Capital Group because we share a common vision and common values. Our vision is that we believe that everyone deserves to spend time with their family while building a bright financial future. And in order to do that, we offer real estate alternative investment opportunities to busy professionals and family providers. Together, we have more than 10 years of experience and we have helped uh, people invest in 2,800 multifamily units with an average of 30% annual return. Tonight, we wanted to share with you our insight about how to ride the wave of economic uncertainty and profit as a real estate investor. We've researched five topics we wanted to share with you. First, an overview of the current investment market. Second, the impact of uncertainty on the real estate market. Third, the importance of being prepared as a real estate investor. Fourth, our preferred strategy to handle the current conditions, that is diversification. And fifth, we want to keep an eye of, on interest rates going forward because they have a significant role in the real estate market. Jeff? Yes, yeah, so um, we'll start off with overview of the current investment market. Um, so on March 22nd, the FOMC, which is that chart to your right, is the uh, Federal Open Markets Committee, which is the Fed's policymakers. They voted unanimously, uh, raised their benchmark um, interest rate by 25 basis to just under 5%. And this comes at the heels of a 25% raise back in February of this year. So what these uh, hikes tighten financial conditions um, because they make borrowing expensive. So more expensive when you're seeking a loan or even carrying hard balance um, or balancing your credit cards. Um, this Increases also decrease the purchasing power. As rates go up, the amount you can afford goes down. And it also lowers consumption and production of goods and services. So some adverse effects of this monetary policy uh, increases. It, it uh, pretty much in increases unemployment and it declines um, the economic growth. And all this is in an effort to lower inflation. So furthermore, these rate hikes, these uh, rapid rate hikes in, since in, during 2020, 2022 have had unintended consequent, con consequences with the US banking system. Um, so on March and March 10th and March 12th, uh, two banks, were shut down by regulators and taken over by the FDIC, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. These um, Signature Bank was the 16th largest bank in the US with over $200 billion assets and Signature was the 29th with 110 billion. A third, Silvergate had almost 4 billion. So these banks, However, we're not are not considered systemically important. Systemically important banks are banks that hold assets within the trillions. So, what happened with um, with these banks? So, there was a bank run in which 
too many depositors sought to withdraw their funds from the bank at the same time. So SPV for one, it was a very uh, was a bank for a very niche type of investor or investment type, um, which were startup tech companies, and so in and, and uh, Silvergate and Signature Bank were heavily uh, invested in um, cryptocurrency. So it was very niche type of investments. Following the pandemic and due to low interest rates, SVB for one was flooded with cash, which led venture backed companies to raise large sums of money, cheap money. So as these investments, so these, so as these, uh, this capital that was flooded into the bank um, was just sitting there in deposits, SVB did what they were supposed to do and they invested that money into U.S. government bonds, which is a safe investment. However, as interest rates rose, the value of these bonds decreased. Also, as there was less capital available, these companies started to withdraw their to expenses um, in order to continue to grow. Um, they were having trouble finding capital in order to help them grow, pulling out this money. So SVB started facing a lack of liquidity, and they were forced to sell bonds at a at a loss of about two hundred or two billion dollars loss. So they had unrealized loss, and then after selling them, they had realized their losses. So the bank's vulnerability was the having high proportions of uninsured deposits and a large proportion of deposits invested in hold to maturity securities, which they had to sell. They held them to maturity. There wouldn't have been a problem, but because these companies needed capital to keep the doors open, it became a problem. Plus, another thing to consider is a lot of these tech companies had more than $250,000 in their accounts. So the FDIC amount, so that became a problem. So with the bank being shut down, there was a, a frenzy of all these companies losing their, their money and not being insured. <clears throat> so the stock market volatility the rational behavior depends. So with multiple Fed hikes here in the past, you know, uh, what, 16 months, um, less access to capital became a, became more of an occurrence. This high inflation, post-pandemic recovery, uh, the Chinese economy and sanctions in the Ukrainian-Russian war, these all have potential to continue to disrupt the markets. Now, um, about a week ago or so, the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Janet Yellen, she came on and said that the government is willing to take further action to guarantee bank deposits, which was a bailout for SVB and Signature Bank. However, um, they also said that for other banks, that that's a possibility, but there's still the consideration of the sys systemic risk exception. That's when the Fed steps in if a bank is systemic, system, systemically important uh, to the global market, which these banks are not considered as systemically important. Uh, banks such as JP Morgan, large banks like that, which carry capital in the trillions, are considered systemically important, as in too big to fail. Now, to get into real estate, um, demand for real estate has been strong and inventory has been low and remains low. Um, investors remain active and are still attractive to real estate. However, the housing market has continue to evolve and in recent years, the volatility has increased due to these fluctuation in uh, 
in rates. So um, as far as home ownership, it has really become difficult for for um, many many uh, many folks in society, uh, really low income families and young professionals looking for their first home. So therefore, renting is becoming a more common option as these costs have increased along with rent prices as a result of housing shortages. So there's a choice that needs to be made. Can you afford a house or can you afford rent? Um, so sometimes it's cheaper to rent, but it obviously depends on the region. So um, this graph here shows homeowners and investors are forecasted to remodel homes. So according to this data, in 2027, nearly 24 million homes in America will enter this prime remodel phase, which is a period of meaningful um, renovations and improvements. So this could be an opportunity for rehabbers to set the stage for the coming years, whether they want to buy homes to rehab or they're also an opportunity to get involved in short-term debt investment these uh, rehabbers will need capital. And with the availability of capital or capital being more expensive from banks, they could turn to um, alternative investments from investors looking to make a return on their investment. And they could you know, borrow from people like you and I. Next slide. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so uncertainty, Uncertainty significantly uh, impacts confidence in uh, in real estate or market, but it also has effects on things outside of our control. So many factors in the market have created economic uncertainty, of which is one of the forefront on everyone's mind. So we're going to dive a little deeper on the impacts. So here on um, you have a um, it's a market sentiment survey that identifies major factors to consider with inflation <clears throat> and uh, inflation and rates being top concerns as well followed by energy costs and there's been an energy cost across the board um, and everything from the cost of procurement of energy to the increases in transmission, and distribution costs. Um, other things that that affect high energy costs are, you know, um, deregulation. In certain states, there is uh, deregulation of their electric electrical market, uh, something that occurred back in the '90s. But also the big push for green energy. A lot of those costs are pushed onto consumers. So therefore, increasing the cost of energy, you add the instability of in Russian war. Um, you look at the European um, market, you look at their energy costs, they're through the roof. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of things that are, you know, that correlate to this rise in energy costs as well. And then you look at the currency volatility. So the demand for a dollar for the dollar is usually high as it's the world's uh, reserve currency, but other factors that influence whether or not the dollar rises in value in comparison to other currencies include our inflation, trade deficits, and the political stability. So impacts. So reduction of investments. So investors may be hesitant to put their money to work, stepping on the line as uh, as they wait to see what's uh, what's going to happen because of so many so so many moving parts, so much vol volatility. Also, um, delayed transactions. By that we mean you know buyers would be looking at uh, to time the market possibly. Uh, by delaying transactions, sales, or purchase, and for the economy conditions to become more clear. Um, we're also looking at changes in financing. As we discussed earlier, lending standards are tightening up and securing financing 
has become more difficult. So lower LTV with higher uh, DSCR debt surge ratio is what we're going to be here in the in the coming years. Um, not even the coming years; it's here now. Um, and if you you don't understand what the DSCR is, essentially it's available cash flow to pay your debt obligations um, on a on a on loan. And then we have a and for so for example, in times of economic uncertainty, uh, luxury properties may decrease while demand for affordable housing increases. Or vice, um, investors might be interested in class A properties, um, more luxury properties where tenants have higher income and available funds compared to a tenant with lower income and less funds available. All right, next slide. All right, the importance of being prepared as a real estate investor. Uh, so in the context of the current market conditions, we wanted to go over how to be prepared as a real estate investor. Here, we want to, to let uh, uh, passive investors know that economic uncertainty doesn't necessarily mean that it, it's not the right time to invest in the market. So there are four, four topics we, want to, we wanted to discuss here. Uh, the first one is to uh, stick to the basics. And uh, this is what we discussed in our last webinar. You know, the number one fundamental thing to do is market research. You want to analyze the current state of the real estate market in, in a particular area, uh, the demographic profile, the supply and demand, and market economic conditions in general. Uh, we wanted to also to share some specific examples of some of these parameters that we use. For instance, the uh, a market size above 500,000 people that's that's what we would be looking at, you know, nothing below that. Also, we want to see population growth, you know, at least uh, 1% per year over the past few years and multiple employers for multiple industries. You don't want to be tied to a single industry. So uh, we look at other market characteristics as well, such as does the median income support three times the rents? Also, how much crime is there in that area? Um, how is the school system? Are there shopping centers closed? You know, in other words, you know, do do people want to move in this area and stay there? Second, uh, you know, the thing to consider to be prepared is, you know, what business plan are you going to to look at? You know, for for deals, you know, what's the asset size, the class, the location, the strategy? You know, we we with Jeff we developed our own criteria here. You know, we are looking uh, mostly at commercial multifamily properties of a hundred and plus uh, units, class A and B being you know the more recently built uh, uh, properties located in the Sun Belt with the value add opportunity. You know. Uh, a, uh, a key question to consider is how you're going to add value into uh, a deal, into a property. You know, are the rents uh, below the, the market rents? And if yes, you know, what do you need to do to achieve the, the market rents or, or even better? You know, is there renovations involved or is it just a problem with marketing? So when you increase the bottom line, that Jeff mentioned earlier, the NOI, net operating income, you're going to increase the value of the property. Other things to consider, how long uh, uh, do you need to execute your business plan? You know, is it is it uh, one year, two year, or three year? Uh, uh, you would need to, uh, uh, to implement your business plan. So it will correspond to a, a you know, three to five year hold, for instance, of, of a particular deal. Also, what are your returns goals? For example, you know, we are aiming at doubling the investor's money in five years in multi on, on multifamily deals. Um, and finally, you know, it's something I'm going to spend a little more time on is, is the debt, you know, is it permanent debt or uh, bridge debt? So financing, 
Financing is a key component of a deal because uh, the lender is going to be the number one investor in the deal. They're going to end up financing or owning, you know, 60 to 80 uh, percent, uh, paying for 60 to 80 percent of the value of the purchase price. So with the, the high interest rates, the, the debt becomes more and more expensive and, you know, it needs to be chosen carefully, obviously. So there are different options whether the deal is stable or not. A deal being stable means it's 90% occupied for, for the past three months. So if you, if you have a stable deal, you have access to agency debt, uh, being Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the uh, traditional lenders that are lending also on single family that you, you may be familiar with, um, or directly or indirectly. So, uh, and that's traditionally the, the least expensive debt available, though recently local banks have been also pretty competitive because the rates are so high. And, and local banks, they don't necessarily have the same uh, baseline to, 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 uh, to have their, their um, loans, their interest rates uh, adjusted on. So uh, finally, if the deal is not stable, the bridge debt is the only option available. So typically uh, bridge debt, you know, bridge meaning it's a bridge to permanent debt, permanent being uh, agency debt. It's going to be short-term financing uh, between two and three years with uh, heavy renovations that are also being financed. The bridge debt come usually with variable interest rates. So in, in all that I mentioned uh, uh, now, you know, the, the things to consider is going to be first, you know, what's the term of the debt? You know, how long was the length of the loan? Um, you know, is it aligned with your business plan? You know, do you, do you, can you borrow and, and keep that money for the length of your, your business plan? Do you have an option to extend the term, the length of the loan? Is the interest rate fixed or is it variable? You know, we prefer to have a clear vision on the cost of debt. So we prefer to have an interest rate that is uh, uh, fixed or, or if it's variable, we, we, pref we, we would use a cap to that interest rate. Uh, also, what are the prepayment penalties? Because if you want to get out early to be able to benefit of market conditions, you want to know how much is going to cost you because some of the prepayment penalties, they are tied to the treasury, the value of the treasury that, you know, as uh, we mentioned earlier, is going to fluctuate based on the, the market interest rates. Other things to consider is the, if there is an interest only payment period, and maybe there could be an option to assume an existing debt because the interest rate is low. You know, all, all of these factors, they're going to be uh, mixed with the loan to value uh, of, of how much you're going to borrow to finance uh, the, uh, the deal, you know, usually between 60 and 80%, and also the, the debt service coverage ratio uh, which is net operating income divided by debt that is should be above uh, 125. Um, so obviously a lot of a lot of things to consider there and, and you know ideally you want to use a loan broker to explore these different options to guide you you know to pick the best the best debt possible. Uh, the last uh, Topic to, to consider to be prepared as a real, real estate investor is to develop a network of professionals because real estate is a team sport. You know, you will work with property managers, you know, hands down the key to the, the successful deal because they execute your business plan on a day-to-day -day basis, but also contractors, real estate brokers, attorneys, accountants, and even own other owner operators, because you know, in, in our case, we're going to not only look deals ourselves, but also consider deals of others. And, and for that, we've developed criteria to select other owners operators as partners. 
you know, for example, we, we, we defined a thousand unit under management as a minimum, plus to have completed two uh, deals full cycles. And we also want to, to hear, you know, uh, from references from, from investors and equity partners who worked with this owner operator. And, you know, all of that to say that it takes time to vet all these team members and develop relationships. Diversification, in, in this time of uncertainty, um, we think the best strategy to reduce risk and increase returns is to diversify your portfolio. So first, the benefits of diversification. You know, the short version is you, you don't want to put all your eggs in the same basket. You know, you want to manage risk. You know, uh, uh, for example, have part of your portfolio in higher returns, higher risk investments, and part in lower returns, lower risk, because usually uh, uh, there's a correlation between uh, returns and risk, right? Um, also, you know, you want to consider, you know, the, the time frame. You know, maybe you want to invest part of your portfolio in a shorter time hold, and another part in a longer time hold. That you know, money that you don't need right away. Uh, finally, you know, what what you have to uh, um, or what uh, diversifying will help you do is to to be able to protect to be protected against market fluctuations, right? Because Different markets, they are going to be in different phases of expansions and compression uh, in, in, in their, their own cycles. Also, different asset classes, they are going to be at different stages. And here we, we added uh, two illustrations about the multifamily market cycle and the industrial market cycle uh, uh, to, to show you the uh, expansion to recession wheel there. And you can see that you know you have different markets. They're going to be at different stages in these uh, uh, market cycles. Um, you know whether they are in one asset class or the other. So, so uh, if we take a closer look here uh, in the industrial uh, real estate uh, illustration, we see a majority of the markets they are mid expansion to early hyper supply, whereas in multifamily, most of the markets are still in an expansion phase. So next, you know, the ways to diversify and, you know, as we just illustrated there, you know, you want to consider different property types or asset classes such as multifamily, industrial, short-term rentals, or even maybe debt supporting real estate can, can be an option. Uh, also, different geographic locations. You know whether it, it's uh, uh, you know in the United States we have so many uh, very strong states uh, with with strong real estate and and um, uh, owner friendly uh, laws such as Texas, Arizona, Georgia, and South Carolina. Um, and finally, you want to look at the the different business plans and and. and you know, diversify, invest in different business plans. Uh, those are known as core, meaning it's a stable, newer asset. Value add, meaning it's the value you know, that is going to be created typically thanks to innovations. Opportunistic uh, usually means it's a distressed, you know, there's low occupancy and, you know, it was well not well taken care of, but there will be a lot of, uh, uh, renovations to be made and uh, uh, development or ground up development. You know, you start with the bare land and you're going to, to build a, a new construction. So typically these business plans, they're going to range from high cash flow, low returns for core to low cash flow, high returns for developments. And, and, and you know, you have everything in between. We, we like to actually be more in between, like in the value add or, you know, the core plus, which is between core and, and value add. That's our, that's our niche there, uh, that, that we have most of our deals um, that are going to be in that area. So be, meaning that you, you'll, you'll have decent cash flow and, and, and decent returns. It's, it's, we feel, we think it's a good balance. Um, 
the, the chart is showing also uh, a, a survey of fund managers and it's showing that there is an expectation of more opportunities opportunistic deals and it's not necessarily the same opportunity opportunistic deals that i mentioned earlier uh, of of you know distressed properties because of low occupancy is going to be more because the the deals are financially distressed because uh, a few years back there was the, the market got very hot interest rates were very low and there are a lot of assets that have been purchased at a very high uh, price point with very low interest rate and maybe bridge debt that was not necessarily capped. And now you have all these, these uh, loans that are coming due. So the deal may be performing okay overall, mm -hmm. but the, the cost of, of uh, uh, setting up new debt is going to be much, much higher. That's why you know th there would be uh, financially distressed deals, but not necessarily, um, you know, economically or you know with occupancy that is that is terrible. So there will be opportunities there. You know, when we we know several uh, uh, um, deals that are coming to the market with with that profile, and and that where we're, we're looking at. Um, but you know, we're, we're here we wanted to mention also um, one of our current offerings, a portfolio of three properties with core, core plus and value add business plans located in, in different states. So, you know, when, when uh, uh, we created our company, it was really our goal to offer diversification to, to investors. And, you know, we'll, we'll discuss more that about that in a, in a, in a few minutes. The, the two last uh, uh, things to look at from a diversification standpoint, you know, the factors to consider, you know, what's what's the investor uh, risk tolerance and investment goals? You know, are you looking more for cash flow or are you more interested in capital appreciation, right? Uh, uh, in, in growing your portfolio, um, you know, what what's your available uh, capital to meet the minimums? You know, you have to look at your whole investment portfolio and, you know, maybe you want to, to dedicate only a portion of it to real estate or maybe you want to invest all of it to, to real estate, which, you know, I think I would, I would tend to, to say it's not necessarily a bad idea uh, to, be, to be very heavy in, in real estate. Um, also, what are your available resources to study the market and asset classes, you know, or, or maybe build a relationship with a new provider? Right, you know, or, or do you want to rely on on a team who is who has this expertise and boots on the ground and do can do that for you? Uh, finally, uh, what are the tax implications? You know, whether you are active in real estate or passive is going to be different. You know, are you going to how much you're going to benefit of depreciation and and uh, how will you be taxed on capital gains? The challenges are. Um, you know, the difficulty to, to manage multiple properties and investments, you know, many deals, if, if you are invested in many deals that are managed by many providers, you know, tracking their performance and, and you know, ju just collecting all the information may be challenging. So, you know, something that, that's part of the difficulty of managing multiple properties. Uh, also, you know, you may have limited access to certain investment vehicles, right? So for instance, you know, in some cases you need to be accredited, some other cases you don't, you don't need to be accredited. Do you have a pre-existing relationship with the operator or, you know, how much do you want to be active uh, in, in a deal, you know? And if so, if you're active, for instance, can you afford to buy multifamily alone? You know, that's why we, we are... Uh, we, we think multifamily syndications is, is a is a great way to uh, to be invested in in in, uh, in real estate. Um, finally, depending uh, um, in in how you you decide to proceed, you know there could be higher transaction costs and fees. For instance, if you compare buying ten ten single family properties to buying one apartment building of ten units, you know there's going to be an economy of scale. So again, you know, we 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 think 
with uh, our, our fund or Boost Wealth Fund, you know, we 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 think we we want to offer one of our goals was to was to offer our diversification to our investors. So Jeff, I hand this back mm -hmm. to you for interest rates. Okay. <clears throat> Great. All right. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, so. Um, so keep an eye on interest rates. Um, so interest rates have climbed uh, for five weeks straight, um, according to uh, the source Freddie Mac um, back in March nine. My March. Keep in mind the uh, that the Federal Reserve does not set uh, the mortgage rates. It's um, it's their monetary policy that is a factor on interest rates. So um, you know consider consider that. Next page. Next slide. I'm sorry. Here's a graph uh, of the mortgage rates upward trajectory. That red arrow pretty much points out, you know, the five-year, I'm sorry, the five-week uh, increase. Um, <clears throat> so, besides monetary policy, uh, mortgage rates by many factors, which include uh, inflation, the inflation rate, job growth, and whether the economy is growing or or shrinking. Um, also, you know, the, the more money the Fed prints, the more money supply is in the, it devalues, you know, the, the current savings and increases prices, which is that inflation we're talking about. Um, so, you know, higher interest rates increase your debt to ratio, debt to income ratio, which means less buying power of any real estate you are shopping for. The next slide um, is a historical data with the 90 day forecast. Uh, in that 90 day forecast, we are one month into that. That takes you out till May 23rd. So you see that red arrow there. It's just the zoomed out portion of the previous graph showing the five week. Um, and then you see the projections were pretty much moving horizontal. Um, and today's, you know, current national average is 6.85. And according to the graph, it's a little bit lower, but um, we'll see how things change. You look at to the look at the graph to the right, it shows historical um, interest. So we have not yet reached the um, the average for the historical rates. We're still below. So that's that's a good sign. And so as inflation cools and the Fed, you know, slows down its increases, um, the increases have been 25 basis points, which is a lot smaller raise than the previous 5% or uh, 75 basis points increases. So that's, that's a good sign. Next slide. <clears throat> so pretty much... Uh, with with all said, with all this said, you know, e economic uncertainty doesn't necessarily mean a negative market. Um, but it's essential to be up to date on market trends in the real estate industry or whatever industry you choose to invest in. So by understanding these trends, you know, we can make more informed investment decisions that will help maximize returns and investments. And there's a quote, you know. Been around for a while uh, by Warren Buffett. Be fearful when others are greedy, and be greedy when others are fearful. I think I feel that you know analyzing all all available data and making a smart investment decisions um, shouldn't be you know put on the you know you shouldn't put you on the sidelines. You know um, wealth is made in these economic conditions. It's just how you do it is what matters. Um, and we want to take a few moments uh, to quickly tell you about our um, opportunities, which uh, explain a little. Yeah, and uh, just, you know, to let you know, we're going to open uh, Q&A in, uh, in, in, in a couple of minutes after I'm done talking about these opportunities. So, you know, feel free to type any question you, you have. Uh, in the the Q and A, uh, and we will we will get uh, to to answering them. Uh, so um, the first opportunity we wanted to to share is our portfolio one. Uh, it's uh, uh, 
portfolio of three properties representing three, 654 units. They are located in uh, three different markets, two states, and uh, they have different business plans. One is core, it's a brand new property. Uh, one is core plus, uh, and, and the last one is value add. So I think it's, it's the Houston is core, it's from 2020. Uh, core plus would be the Tucson property, which is uh, late 90s and early 90s for, for Phoenix. Uh, with with much uh, more of a value add proposition there, so the the returns are about one point nine x on your equity in five years. There's a preferred return of eight uh, percent, internal rate of return of fourteen point three percent, and average annual return of seventeen point two. It's currently cash flowing. And I forgot to mention uh, the disclaimer. Uh, please forgive me, but performances or, or performance estimates are not a guarantee of future results. It's a 506C uh, uh, deal, you know, uh, exemption by accredited investors only. And you can see uh, additional information about risks in our offering materials. The other uh, current opportunity that we wanted to share with you is something that is uh, a brand new and we felt was very timely to, to offer to, to our investors. It's uh, 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 related to short-term debt. So it's, it's going to be a, a, an opportunity to, to lend money, to do... Um, either fix and flips or renovations or land uh, uh, or uh, house for house development for single family developments. And uh, so all of these uh, loans, they are going to be secured by real estate assets. From an investor standpoint, it's totally transparent. You know, it's like at the fund level, everything is, is managed. Uh, uh, and and you know we are going to vet the uh, uh, the loans, and uh, uh, um, you know just share the returns between all the loans to to the investors. So it's focused on on a cash on cash of ten percent per year with quarterly distributions. <clears throat> so with that said, uh, we can move to our Q and A. So I have um, a question here. Uh, it's, um, what what are the impacts of the current market conditions on returns? Yeah. So be, because of the high cost of financing, and uh, also because of you know, I think there's still hopefully it is phasing out, but there's still a, a, a relatively high expectation from owners on, on, on the selling price. So there's, there's a little bit of a, of a gap between uh, uh, how much we can afford you know, to, to pay for a deal and, and what, what the deal, um, you know, it, 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 what, what the owners, they want, they want to sell. So overall that put a lot of pressure on, on returns. So returns are, are slightly lower. But what, what suffered the, the most was the cash flow. So there are a lot of, of deals that because of the cost of the debt, the, the, the cash flow uh, for the first few years went, went down. So it's not unusual to see um, deals with you know, 1%, 2% cash flow year one, uh, and then progressively uh, that, that is going to be uh, going up. Okay. So um, this other question is almost along the lines. It's uh, if interest rates stay high and rents are not increasing as quickly or there is rent control, wouldn't that create a cash flow problem? So um, I would say yes, uh, but property prices are slowly. And additionally, as investors, you know, we need to underwrite at 
at the purchase price point that makes the deal profitable and take economic factors into. So, you know, that's why, as Philip stated, we like to invest in um, landlord friendly states um, and, you know, try to kind of stay out of rent control um, areas. Uh, not to say that, you know, we're looking to just increase rents astronomic, astronomically, but um, there's some properties that we come across that have not raised rents in a really long time. So, um, you know, we take all those um, every, uh, energy, even services are going up. So we got to take, we have to take all those into account. So the, the there's a question from uh, uh, Richard here, you know, is the, the cycle charts, just an example, are you saying this is current? The, this is from a, a, a current report that, that you know, we, we, we're using. I can, you know, if you, if you, uh, uh, share, you know, and we may have your information, but you, you, you can, uh, we can share the report with you if you're interested. How short term is the short term debt opportunity? So the, the minimum investment, you know, just for stability of the fund, the minimum investment period is one year. That's, um, yeah, compared to the other opportunity, which is uh, a total of five year. So if um, you do have any further questions or you think of one at a later date, feel free to email us um, at info at boostmycapital.com. Reach us on uh, Facebook, LinkedIn. You could, um, you know, scan that barcode. It'll take you to scheduling a call uh, with either of us. It'll take you also to our website. So if, if there's any questions or concerns, feel free to reach out to us and uh, we'll always you as soon as possible. Yep. So that's it for this evening. We thank you for joining us and we look forward to staying, seeing you on our next one. Thank you for coming and uh, see you next month. Bye-bye.